Okay, we're sitting right now with Hannah Kent, whose book is Burial Rights. It's a debut. It's being released in a number of different countries. It's a very exciting time. This is your first book expo? It is, actually. It's my first time to the U.S. Really? It is. I've never been here before. How are you liking the United States so far? I love it. I love it. New York, it's intoxicating. I, uh, I'm already completely in love with this city, and I've only been here for probably about two days, but I'm having a great time so far. So where do you live most of the time? I'm Australian, so I live in, in South Australia in a place called Adelaide, which is the capital. It's, you know, it's a little town, so it's, it's you know, it's lovely for me to be, to be able to come to New York and experience what a real, you know, what a real city is like. Can you talk a little bit about how a girl from Adelaide now finds her book being released globally? When did it all begin? When did you start to write the book? It's a long story, really. Um, and to sort of explain the, uh, I guess, the idea for the book and where that came from, I had to take it back about 10 years, when I was 17 years old and an exchange student in Iceland. I finished high school and I was sort of a bit keen for an adventure and I wasn't really ready to commit myself to, you know, a career that I wasn't really excited about. So I thought as a deferral tactic, I'll go overseas for a year. And I ended up being sent to Iceland for 12 months. And I wasn't sent to Reykjavik, the capital. I was sent to this very small fishing village right up the north, on the north coast, called Sodokroka. And um, basically, I, I really struggled, to be honest. I arrived in January. It was very dark. It was almost 20, about 20 hours of darkness. With, and in around 11 o'clock in the morning, it would slowly get light, it would turn into this strange blue twilight, which would be gone again by three. You know, at night the northern lights would completely overwhelm the sky with their extraordinary belts of colour and, you know, the town was really no more than a very small cluster of houses set into the side of a mountain and a fjord. And the community itself of this small town was very, very closely knit, very tight, everyone knew everyone, and I was very much the outsider as the exchange student. Were you alone? Did you have any friends with you? No, none. And I didn't speak the language. I was very homesick. And so it was really, um, you know, it was, it was tough. It was tough to sort of go to such an alien environment and try to sort of suddenly create a life there. Um, but it was actually during these first few difficult months that I was returning from a visit to the south with my host family. And we passed this very strange tract of landscape in the north called Vatstalshola. Where, which is basically a valley mouth which suddenly erupts from this smooth pastoral land into this, to hundreds and hundreds of hillocks, almost as if the land suddenly got a rash or pimples or something. And um, I was really struck by how bizarre it looked and I asked my host parents if, it, if the area was significant for any reason. And they said, oh look, the, the hills are just like that because it's the way the land is. But over there, something interesting did happen. And they pointed to three small hills which were nestled quite closely together and they told me that that was the site of Iceland's last execution. And I mean, I was immediately curious, as people probably are when they hear these sorts of things, and I asked them, you know, what happened and who it was. And they told me that a, a woman, a servant woman, called Agnes Magnusdottir, had been beheaded there on the 12th of January in 1830 for her role in a very brutal murder of two men and the arson attack that attempted to burn the bodies to destroy the evidence, so to speak. And um, I was immediately intrigued, I think, probably by the fact that it was a woman, but I think also at that particular time this, this idea or this suggestion of a story about someone else who was a, in some ways a similar outsider resonated with me emotionally. And I became just deeply, deeply curious about this elusive figure from the past that I really knew nothing about. And you know, ten years later we have the book, it's sort of, um, I, I never really forgot her and I would always have these questions. and. And I started studying writing at university. And then when I had to write an honors thesis, I started writing about her story and realized that there was so much research that needed to be done. And, and so I wrote this, uh, this novel, Burial Rights, as part of a PhD. How long did this idea sort of sit in your mind waiting to sort of come to fruition? Well, I, uh, I, during the course of my exchange, I, I became continuously, I guess, curious about this woman uh, and I would ask a lot of questions but my understanding of the crime that she was convicted of and also of her wasn't really you know full by any means and then I um, I guess I expected that I would forget about it once I returned to Australia but the opposite was true and I started I, I realized that I had all these unanswered questions and my thoughts would return to her and you know I knew nothing about her but for some reason I was still fascinated with this woman and then I um, and then I realised I went back to Iceland since that first you know ten years ago I've been back about three or four no four times now, and every time I've gone back I would have more and more questions about her I'd find other things or find other sources that would just lead to this I guess the deepening of this curiosity, and so um, 
while I didn't always realise that I would write a book about her, I was always very much fascinated by this story. And it wasn't until I began honours and I started, I guess, touching the surface of all the actual primary sources and the records and I guess the, the facts as much as you could establish them that I realised I needed to, I guess, get my hands dirty and, and go and do a lot of biographical research. And that, a lot of that was performed as part of the PhD. So how much of it is the actual story and how much of it did you take liberties and, and create fiction? It's a novel, obviously, so, it so how much of it is actually rooted in that real story? It's a novel. It, it's actually very hard to draw a line in the sand between what is fact and what is fiction in this book. My approach to writing it was, a, was basically a research-led creative practice. So I decided again quite early on that I would do as much research as possible, not only into her particular life, but into Iceland at that time. And where I, where I could establish or corroborate facts, I would have to stick to them. So I couldn't change them, I couldn't go off on an imaginative whim, I had to stick to the facts as they could be established. But if there were things that were slightly contradictory or a little hazy, then I would use my broader contextual research into Iceland to suggest the most likely possibility. And it was only then in the outright gaps and the silences where I couldn't find anything that I felt I could be free to invent. And so that was my sort of methodology in approaching this book. So in terms of what's real and what's not in this, I mean, I think anything which contains dialogue is obviously has to be fictional. It's all speculative. In fact, actually, it's interesting. I, I make a distinction. I don't actually think of this as a historical novel. I think of it as a speculative biography. Not a definitive history by any means, but a suggestion of a life as it may have been lived. By imposing those rules upon yourself to stick to the history, you really did skew more towards the biography. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny, I think, uh, you know, there can be a very fine line between exploiting someone's life and maybe using it to explore deeper, you know, being ethical about it. And I was very um, cautious, particularly as a foreigner writing about a country that isn't my own. I was very sure to make sure that I, um, I wanted to make sure I got my facts right. And so I spent a lot of time researching Iceland in the early 19th century, which is when this book is set, and also the life of this woman, Agnes Magnusdottir. So going to the National Archives in Iceland and finding her birth records and tracking her throughout various parishes during her life. A lot of, a lot of research. Most of writing this book was research, actually. In many ways, I was inspired by uh, Margaret Atwood's book, Alias Grace, where she talks about using a similar approach, you know, really honouring the facts as a way to, I guess, uh, sidestep some of the ethical dilemmas that you inevitably face when you write about real people from the past. Um, and and I, I sort of took, I remember reading an essay of hers in, in Search of Alias Grace in a book she wrote called Curious Pursuits where she detailed this. And I took a lot of inspiration from that and encouragement and ended up doing more or less something similar. And I'm not sure if she would ever, you know, describe that particular book as a speculative biography or anything along those lines. But I think there is a difference between novels which do exploit people, people's lives from the past in an effort to tell a story or to merely entertain on a superficial level and books like mine where, I mean, at least I hope I've tried to really explore something a little bit more, um, not necessarily closer to the factual truth because sometimes that's just so simply difficult to find but I guess the emotional truth of these events and people's lives. But I mean, how do we ever know? We'll never know really how close we get but we can try, I think. Has anything ever consumed you like this story before? I mean, the idea that you said it just, you were deeply curious and you wanted to follow this and you couldn't let it go. And are you waiting for the next one to happen now so you can think about what the next thing you're going to write, perhaps? Well, that's actually, um, when I was researching this book, I came across an article in a very old British newspaper um, about a crime in Ireland around a similar time, actually, in the 1820s, that has in a similar way, not really let me go. And so that's actually going to be the subject of my next book. Really? Yeah. And you're going to write it in a similar fashion? Well, wait and see. I mean, again, I want to start off by, by researching it and yeah. seeing what that turns up and seeing what direction that sort of pushes me in. And I guess just being open to being able to be pushed in a certain direction by the research, which is nice. It's a slightly intuitive, slightly sort of tangential process of writing a book. But um, I think if you can embrace it, it can work out well. You, uh, you said when you first went to Iceland, it was you were lonely, you felt foreign and unusual. You had no one to talk to, you didn't speak the language. Obviously, now you've submersed yourself in, in Icelandic history and Icelandic customs. Mm. Um, you know a lot more now. What are your feelings about Iceland today, now that you've really lived this Icelandic world? 
Well, it's probably worth saying, you know, during that first year that I lived in Iceland, probably around the six months mark, I had a massive transformation. I learned the language, I started making friends, and I was slowly integrated into that small town that I was sent to. And I ended up having a, the most amazing, amazing time. I mean, it really were, was the year that forged my character in many ways, forged my adult character. And um, the other thing that happened, I guess, over the course of that year was that I fell deeply in love with the country in a way that I actually find quite difficult to articulate because it's, um, I think you can come across as sounding kind of crazy, you know, when you talk about having a spiritual connection to a landscape or having a country get under your skin in such a way that you do it. It's like, it's like falling in love with something. It's kind of irrational and you're kind of obsessed and you don't really know why and you just let it run its course. And I still feel, I think, even more so about that, probably as a result of the research I've done and my new understanding of its history, which I didn't have originally. It's, um, it feels very much actually like a second home for me. And I miss it. I'm homesick for Iceland. Well, it's impressive. And the debut is also very impressive. And I'm so glad you had time to stop by and talk about today. I'm so excited for you. Well, thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. Thank you so much. And yeah. thank you for having oh, me. So nice to meet you.